Good evening and welcome to Calvary Chapel. If you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 20 through 27 and let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for tonight, the opportunity to open your scripture together. Your people, your church have come together, congregate together to, to study your word, to know more about you, to know your heart, to know the future. We well, thank you that you have spoken. You have given us the truth, the truth that will encourage us, the truth that will set us free. And we look to you tonight. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight I've titled, I stole the title actually, this passage is likened to the backbone of Bible prophecy. Probably some of the most important prophecy in the Old Testament. If a person has read it and studied it and understand it, then the way they look at the book of Revelation, then they look at the end times is so much different. See, there are many today that claim that they are Israel. The church is Israel. No, the church is not Israel. God has made unique promises just to Israel, literal promises that God will fulfill to them. And this is so important to understand. God will fulfill them in his time, his way, as he's spoken. Now, I'd like to read from Psalm, Psalm 137, verse 5. It's the psalmist that's, that's reading here. Hear the heart of the psalmist. It says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem. So the psalmist is speaking again to this city, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place where God said he would put his name upon Jerusalem. It was a place that he would inhabit. It's a place where his temple would be. So the psalmist says again, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her, forget her skill. Now, what do we learn by this? The psalmist is talking directly to Jerusalem. His physical body, though, is in Babylon. The 70 years have not, again, been completed in Babylon, but his, his heart is in Jerusalem. And let me ask you a question. Where is your heart tonight? Is it on another island? Is it on your retirement? Or is it in heaven with Jesus Christ? See, the psalmist, as he writes, he knows that God is going to fulfill every promise and God is going to be there. And his people will surround him, and yet they're in bondage, but he's still worshiping. Daniel is, is still with open windows, even though there's not a sacrificial system anymore in, in Jerusalem. It's been destroyed. He still prays toward Jerusalem. He believes the promise of God that one day that he'll return. The psalmist here is showing his deep love for Jerusalem. And for, the, for those that in Israel, that, that is the most meaningful thing because that's where God is going to be and that's where God's going to meet them and he's going to meet them on the mercy seat and they long for that. And, and we mentioned this before, but when those who have been scattered around the world, we call diaspora, return to Israel, they make aliyah, they, as soon as they come off the airplane, they fall down on their knees and they're kissing the ground. And they know that God is fulfilling that promise to them. And yet the best is yet to come. His love for God, for God's holy city, cannot be separated. And I think this is important. See, his, his love for God and, and for that holy city. What is it that you love in this world? Is it what God loves or is it the things that God hates? So often that's true in the church. They're chasing after the things of this world. 
Now, God hears prayers. And Daniel has been praying, and we're going to see that in verses 20 and 23. And, and he's going to be met by an angel. And let me read those verses. Daniel 9, verse 20 and 23 in your text. Follow with me. This is now I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of the people and presenting my supplication before the Lord God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God. And while I was still speaking in prayer, then this man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in a vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening prayer. And he gave me instruction and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have come forth to give you insight and understanding. And at the beginning of your supplica supplications, the command was issued. And I've come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. And so give heed to the message and gain understanding of this vision. Daniel, like the psalmist, had a great love for Jerusalem, a great love for God. He prayed. He was a man of prayer. And this is so important to understand. He was speaking. He was praying. He was confessing. He says, my sin and the sin of the people. See, to the Jewish person, they would lift their hands into the, the heavens. They would look with anticipation and expectation that God is going to hear their prayer and answer their prayer. And at the same time, He's confessing his sin. There's personal sin. There's again the national sin that we're going to talk about more later on. They're there because they had rejected and rebelled against God. And so when the church is sin, we're all guilty in a sense, congregationally, universally. Oh, we know that we're, we're saved, we're kept by the power of God, but, but the sin always affects one another in some way. Daniel was determined, though, to keep seeking God. Keep seeking until God answered. We've talked about this before, and, and, and it's when we're really desperate for God. Desperate for God, that's when maybe one of our loved ones is sick. Maybe our own children. Maybe the loss of a job, the future. We get desperate in prayer. And when we're desperate, we don't let go. And Daniel is desperate for God. He's desperate to hear what God is going to say. Sadly, we can sometimes turn to Someone next to us, someone in the world, to the newspaper, to the radio. And, and there may be good information there, but, but when we need a word, we need a word from God and God alone. Because God will speak wisdom and God will speak truth. And he will not speak in such a way just to tickle your ear. He tells you what you and I need to hear, whether we want to hear it or not. Because he wants to work in us. He would have kept talking to God and praying and continually confessing the sin of Israel and making his request to God and to restore that holy hill and, and again the temple. But he was interrupted. He was stopped. There was this, this man, an angel, an angel of the Lord. And he stops and he's going to speak and he was sent by God to minister. Angels were created as ministering spirits to minister to you and me and we know Gabriel. It's an archangel, one of them. Let me read from Isaiah 65 verse 24. Notice what it says. It's on the screen. It will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer and while they're still speaking, I will hear. This is God speaking again. Listen to the words again. He says, it will also come to pass before they even call. God knows the words that you're going to speak. They're going to come from your mouth before they even come out. I will answer while they are still speaking, and I will hear. 
Elsewhere, it describes God inclines his ear to the one that can barely get the words out of his mouth, whether it's sickness, affliction, whatever it is, suffering. And yet he inclines his ear. God wants to hear you more than oftentimes we want to hear from him. The distractions in the world are pulling us away from hearing and listening to God. And that's something that we need to take the time to learn. To be still and know he's God and learn to listen to God. Chaz and I were talking. Chaz always gives this description of of, of laying his head upon Abba's chest. Abba Father. And he wants to hear the heartbeat of God. How much do you want to hear God? The speed that we see here is a readiness of, of heaven to reveal the, the praying. Again, the man to hear. God's ready to answer your prayers. The problem is we're oftentimes not ready to hear. Is that true? Because we don't want to hear what he says because we want our own way. Just like Israel, self-centered, stiff neck and stubborn. We need to confess and we need to repent. We need to have God stop us in those tracks and not let us harden our hearts. Today, if you would know the scripture, you would need to be a person of, of prayer. Daniel's encouragement came again at this, this evening, again, time of sacrifice. About three o'clock in the afternoon. No more sacrifices, as I mentioned. But he looked in anticipation and expectation. And that's what you and I need to do every day is look with anticipation and expectation I heard Chuck Smith one time, many years ago. He looked for God to move in his life every single day. How about you? How often do you look for God really to move, to do something special, to reveal himself, his grace, or something each and every day? Because that's just who he is. And They may be little things, but I'll tell you, they are big things when God reaches down to reveal himself to you right where he's at. Sacrifices, again, had not been offered since the destruction of the temple in 587, 586 B.C., somewhere in that area, almost a half century earlier. Yet Daniel was faithful. Faithful to offer, again, that, that, that sacrifice of prayer at that time. Lord, here I am. Here's my heart, Lord. I want your heart. I want your way. I want your will. Lord, I'm concerned, and we're going to see about what's important to you. We often come with a bullet list of all the things we want done in our lives We want everything changed around us, but we're not willing to submit to God and let God change us from that inside out. Guess what? He will finish that work, whether we yield to him or not. God delivered a message to Daniel. The archangel, the messenger, brought him a message using Gabriel. Daniel told him that he was, again, he told, Daniel was told that he was greatly beloved by God. How do you like that? Do you know that you, too, are greatly beloved by God? Isn't that wonderful that you are loved by God? Amen. There was a man that was in the islands many years ago, and He was on another island and I brought him over and I wanted to have him teach to a group of people, a group of friends. He was a very gifted, called teacher. And that was always his message. He'd always, to 
all the people he knew, and I don't know how he could keep track of it, but to my pastor on the mainland, he would, he would fax, he would email, he would do something, and it was always saying something. You know what? Jesus told me today to tell you he loves you so very much. Doesn't God love every single person? Doesn't God oftentimes just stop you and, and, and you just kind of ponder on them? You see the work that God's doing and, and you're thankful for them and what God's doing in them and, and, and just to tell them, you know, how much God loves them. It always takes us to the cross, doesn't it? If there's any doubt that God loves you, look at the cross. There's no question God delivered the message to Daniel. He gave him a glimpse of the, the future. I want to remind you, though, of the, the, really the character of Daniel. Daniel was faithful, and Daniel was dedicated. Daniel was faithful and dedicated. How does that start? When, when you seek First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he adds all things. When you keep your eyes upon the author and the finisher of your faith, and you're doing that day in and day out, you know, God is the one that makes your hands, your mind, faithful to him. When we decide to, to live for him, to be a part of what he's doing, when we decide to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow him, he makes us faithful. We don't even realize it, how dedicated we become because we fall in love with him afresh each and every day. He reveals himself. He was dedicated, and I want you to understand how he was dedicated. One of the ways. He was determined not to defile himself with sinful compromise. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have, in some time, some place, have compromised. But you know the wonderful thing? The scripture is so clear. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And he chooses not to remember that sin. And please, don't remind somebody else of their sin. We have enough of our own sin ourselves, And to know that if God chooses not to remember, we need to choose not to remember. Well, if Daniel was faithful and dedicated and determined not to defile himself with sinful compromise, what about you? What about your relationship with the Lord? Are your prayers being answered in your life? Do you see the hand of God working in your life? We certainly have seen it in Daniel's life so far. God's wanting to show himself each and every day to each of us and provide blessings. I think the greatest blessing is to know that God is with us. No matter where we go, if we're at the rubbish dump, he's there. There's no place in this world you can go that he's not there, that he doesn't care, he's not concerned. <clears throat> and you can talk to him. And you can listen to him. And he will speak in what seems to be the most odd places if you only listen. Well, I want to share a few things with you before we move on to the prophecy and things that will help you, help me, help our family and friends really draw close to that love of the Lord. To keep us right in the middle of his love. That's where you want to be. I know that's true because you're here tonight. Well, first there's a need for contrition. Look at the screen, you'll see 2 Chronicles 7, verses 14 and 15. It says, my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. 
will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open, my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. See, these are things that will help us know that our prayer is being heard and that God is going to speak. When I come with this right heart, and we're going to look at it several different ways, but this contrition. Recognizing my sinfulness and I need to, to turn from those sinful ways. There's a cordial heart, a sincere, intense desire for really the, the righteousness of God. In fact, notice what Jeremiah 29, 13 says on the screen. When you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. This is a part of that passage where, again, the children of Israel had been in Babylon almost 70 years, and Daniel's reading that. And, and, and God had a plan. He had a purpose for them. For good. And the good would be that they would seek him. And every one of us should be seeking him each and every day. And you wonder if you're struggling or uh, you've missed that first love relationship or your life is dry. It's because you're not seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. And you have to set healthy boundaries in your life and sometimes say, that's it, that's it. And keep the distance. And you have to have that time with God before Everyone, everything else, before your work, before your family. Because you need God. You need his love poured into your heart. You need to know that forgiveness. You've got to have that certainty. Now well, see, there's importance of knowing, again, the certainty, the, the conviction even. In Mark eleven twenty four, 24, it says this, Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask and believe that you Receive them and they will be granted. Wow. That when you pray anything according to his will, it's done. God says it's done. Do you believe that? And oftentimes we don't believe that because we look at the circumstances and the circumstances are so big and we're not looking at God. But when we believe God, just as Abraham believed God, it was credit to him as righteousness. We look at the men that have gone before us. George Mueller is one of them. Men of prayer and faith. They believed God. They trusted in God. Hudson Taylor and a, a, a list of them because they have come to put God first Believing that God will do exactly what he said. Well, there's also the consecration in James 5.16. Notice on the screen, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray, pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Be transparent. Be honest. Say when you're wrong, you're wrong, you sinned. Seek forgiveness. Do whatever it takes to make it right. These are the things that, that open the door. God sees our heart. God, God's concerned about our heart. We're concerned about things, moments, motions, feelings. And God wants to give you a peace that passeth all understanding no matter what's going on well let's not forget the importance of compliance or conformity to god in first john three twenty two, notice what it says and whatever you ask we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing to him what do we do again we keep his commandments this is not talking about going back in the the sacrificial system the ceremonial system jesus summarized it very simply love god with all your heart and mind and soul and, and strength and the second is love your neighbor love 
And if you love people, you will tell them about Jesus. If you love people, you're not going to sin against them. You're not going to take advantage of them. You're not going to cheat them. You're not going to judge them. In fact, you'll take the speck out of your brother's eye after you've taken the log out of your own eye. Well, next I want to point out again in verses 24 through 27, really, as I mentioned, I title this the backbone of Bible prophecy. And again, when we look at this, we're going to see that much of this has been fulfilled, but yet not all has been fulfilled. Now, there's two groups of people I just want to mention tonight. I'm sure there's much more. There, there are those that are looking for a date, and there are those that are just simply looking for Jesus to come. What camp are you in? Some people are so worried about date and setting dates and when is it going to be, and who's this and who's that, and, and certain the scripture is clear in some areas and some areas it's not, as we've talked about before. Are we occupying till he comes? And yet at the same time ready to go and meet him any time that we hear that trumpet call. Look with me. Verse 24, we see the issue of requirement of time of God's plan. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to make atonement for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up a vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy place. What's interesting that we're going to notice is, first of all, this is for the Jewish people. Look back at verse 24 just for a second. Seventy weeks, we'll talk about that in a second, have been decreed for your people. Who are the people? Daniel, it's, Daniel, it's your people. It's the Hebrew people. It's the Jewish people. It's not talking about, again, a church who thinks they're Israel. It's not talking about the Gentiles. While there will be Gentiles there, the purpose of all of this is to deal with Israel. Because they have gone into Babylon, and there's, this is part of the judgment, and it will not be completed until all of this is done. So who is it for? Notice again, it's for the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. And notice, and your holy city. What is that holy city? It's not New York City. It's not Miami. And, and people try and say all different kinds of places. It's Jerusalem, the place where God said he would put his name upon. So the, the first thing I want you to know is this is about Israel. And all prophecy in times focus around Israel, not what's happening in the New York Times or CNN, but what is happening in Israel. Because that's the prophecy of the end time. God is going to fulfill those promises. I'm not saying there's not worthy news in these different places. What is the problem with this world? The problem is very simple. Sin. And it doesn't matter what country you're in. But if you want to understand prophecy, it is about Israel and God fulfilling every promise to the Hebrew people. Now, it's 70 weeks have been decreed. It determined another word that would be used. It's going to cover 490, and this is important, years. Now, that 70 weeks refers again to 70 weeks of years. There's a word called haptad. It's there's an interchangeable word, and I can't remember what it is tonight, but it means a, in that Eastern mind, a week of years. So it's when you see the 70 weeks, it's 70 weeks of years, 70 times 7 comes up with this 490 years. There's six things, though, that we're going to see that will be accomplished during this period of time. The first thing I want to call your attention to is really that 
issue of rebellion to finish the transgression. Look there in that verse, it, it, to finish the transgression. The finish is, is from the Hebrew word that means to restrict, restrain, and this is important, to shut up or simply to finish. He's going to bring an end to it. And, and, and what is it about? Well, there's the word transgression, which means rebellion. He's, he's going to bring this rebellion to an end. There's going to be no more rebellion. There's going to be a world one day with no sin, no rebellion, no lies, no death, nothing immoral, no judgment of others. And Jesus Christ will rule and reign. This prophecy is, is God is going to finish the, the, the fulfilling of this in the Jewish people as well as all those who call upon the name of the Lord. The purpose of this 70-week period is the completion of apostasy, that falling away from the truth. This is why, again, Israel went into bondage for 70 years because of their idolatry, their immorality, they're sacrificing of their own children, their own babies. And most people, they can't imagine, why would God bring the people out of Egypt only to kill all the people of the land because they'd come to the point of no return because they were sacrificing their own babies just like the Chaldeans did. Even sawing them in half, infants for the purpose of prosperity. They became like the Canaanites in many ways. Be very careful the people that you choose to hang out with because you will become like them in many ways. How do I know that? You ever see a husband and a wife and they've been together for many, many years don't they become like each other in, in many ways and mannerisms and children? They pick up our good traits and bad traits, learn behavior. Yeah. Our children seem to pick up more of the bad traits than the good traits sometimes, don't they? Unfortunately, and we'll do the same thing. So we have to be careful who we hang with, those friends what we listen to, what we read, because we need to keep ourselves for God. We're in the world, but not of that world. So here he's going to deal with the completion of the apostasy. He's going to deal with the, the rebellion of the Jewish people who, who had just become like the world. It wasn't enough just to warn them of the worldliness and the danger of it. They did it. They didn't listen. And the world is, is following the footsteps of this country, especially the footsteps of the Roman Empire. And it's going to fall, just like the Roman Empire. For Israel, the ultimate, though, rebellion was the rejection of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. At the close of the 490 years, Israel will except the Messiah. They will sing like never before, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They will see his handprints, the marks on his feet and his side. This is what God's going to accomplish. He really has a plan and a purpose. It's for their welfare and not for their calamity. Everything that they've been going through, and you're, we'll talk more about that as we go through, it's for their good. You and I cannot understand, but, but God says it's for the good. Do you remember Daniel when he was praying for forgiveness of sins? Here God is promising that he is going to remove not only the he's going to remove the sins. They'll find forgiveness, but there'll be no more sin. No more missing the mark. Daniel's prayer will finally be answered and fulfilled. Well, there's the issue of the removal of the, the sin offerings to, to make an end to sin. 
See, God has given us, in, in a sense, kind of like a, a map of prophecy, what's going to be accomplished. He's going to make an end to sins. To make an end to sin is it, what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, their Messiah. He offered himself freely. He was the Passover lamb. He died upon the cross once for all. There'll be no more need for sin offerings anymore. No more need for a sacrificial system because Jesus Christ, the one who was sinless, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins, every one of our sins was imputed to him. He who knew no sin became sin for you and me that we might become that righteousness of God. When he died upon the cross, he cried, it was finished. You know that ties in with this verse, it's finished. It's done. And all we need to do is believe and trust and rest, and we know in the right time it will be completed. He who began a good work in you, he will complete it. This context is talking about Israel. Now, let me read from Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 14. For thus says the Lord, when the 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you and bring you back into this place. That's what they were looking for. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And he has that same for you. And then you will call upon me, come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me, and you'll search for me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back into this place where I sent you and exile. Ezekiel 36, again, the bones that were raised. People thought that was the nation of Israel, and they started predicting a time that the Messiah was going to come back. But when they came back, as this is kind of like talking, they came back in unbelief. God's talking about the time that they will come back and believe, acknowledging him, and knowing that he is God. And knowing what he's done and knowing the patience of God and the kindness of God leads them to repentance. There's the issue of reconciliation or atonement. Notice again in our text there it says to make atonement for iniquity. So atonement for iniquity would be accomplished. Atonement meaning to, to cover or another way of saying it is to make reconciliation. He covered our sins that we would be reconciled to him. Love covers a multitude of sins. Do you believe that? Do you, if you believe that, then you will treat everyone around you in that same way. If you love them, what does it do? It, it, it covers those sins. You're forgiving, you're gracious, you're loving because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. See, those who put their faith in that finished work of the cross, they, they experience, and this is important, experience the atonement for the sins. They, they know that they're, they're covered. They know that God sees them just as they never sinned. They know that one day they will boldly go to that throne of grace, not just spiritually here, but they will in heaven. They know now they can boldly go to that throne of grace and, in prayer, and he hears them. Our sins are covered simply because of the, the blood of the Lamb. And we're washed as white as snow. Romans 5, 10, 11 says this, for or if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we have been saved by his life. Not only this, but we 
also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have been received and reconciled. Wow. See, at the end of the tribulation, Israel will turn to Christ, their Messiah, for salvation. And this prophecy will be finally fulfilled. You know, God doesn't lie. So many people try to explain it away, but, but God will forgive them. God will open up their hearts. God will write on the tablets of their heart as he's written on the tablet of your heart as a believer. You know that right from wrong. In Psalm 22, verse 16, it says, For dogs have surrounded me, and a band of evildoers has encompassed me, and they pierced my hands and my feet, and, and, and they will be reconciled to God, and they will see his handprints, his feet, his side, and they will know what he's done. They'll know the hardness of their, their parents, the grandparents, the hearts, the deception. But they will enjoy all the promises given to Abraham, the abundant blessings that, that are going to be in Christ during the reign in that millennial kingdom. Now Christ will reign with a rod of iron, but there will be righteousness and that's what we're going to deal with next is this issue of righteousness to bring everlasting righteousness. Everlasting righteousness. That, that reminds me that we are saved for all eternity. We will, we're saved and we're, we'll be saved and we'll be saved all eternity. There's no, no going back and falling off the wagon. Again, there's that removing of sin. It's not only... Uh, a step in God's program for Israel, but again, the sin's removed and it's replaced with righteousness. Now, I don't know if anyone here has had a habit. I think we all have some kind of habit. Some have, have drank too much and got drunk. Some have smoked and some have done all kinds of things. Some of us eat too much. But what happens is that when you replace when you get rid of something, you always replace it with something else. And when God gets rid of the sin, he replaces it with righteousness. What a wonderful thought. Not only does he impute his righteousness to you and me now, you are declared righteous before him. But you will have the righteousness of God right from your heart. In my heart. Listen as I read 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20 and 21. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God was making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What a wonderful thought. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, let me remind you, your identity is not in Calvary Chapel. That's where we are. It's not in a, being a Baptist or Methodist. Our identity is in Christ Jesus if you've been born again. And this is where people make the mistake. They're always trying to identify with the world worldliness. Not saying the church is worldly in every way, but our identity must always be in Christ, and our lives need to be centered around Christ, and he must be preeminent before everything else in this world if you want to keep yourself in the love of God. Now, again, this is a good place to insert this. We don't need to worry about anybody else. There's enough just right there to keep ourselves in the love of God, isn't it? We don't need to be sin sniffing, fault finding, looking at anybody else. We need to focus on what we should be doing. And when we do see somebody walking in that righteousness of God, man, that flame encourage him. I thank God for what God's doing in your life. Daniel was encouraged in the prayer. We need to be encouragers just as Gabriel did. Notice again, as I mentioned already, that, that everlasting righteousness, it reminds us really 
Salvation is for eternity. It's no end. We've been saved from the penalty of sin. We've been saved from the sin in our life. We've been saved from the wrath. And we've saved to God. And we will walk with him for all eternity. Marveling at everything that he's done, everything he's allowed. So once saved, we're saved forever. And we are the righteousness of God. That's one of the things that people struggle with is, is knowing the love of God and knowing that they have this standing with God, they're the righteousness of God, and, and, but at the same time that he is forging that into you and me. He's making you the righteousness of God. The millennial kingdom that we talk about at the end of the tribulation it's there that Jesus Christ will rule and reign for a thousand years. And that age is characterized by righteousness. How would you characterize our age right now? Sin, immorality, death, murder, all the list goes on. Right is wrong, and wrong is right. Isaiah 61, 11 says this, For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as the garden causes things to be sown it to the spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. You know, our righteousness should affect everyone else around us because Jesus Christ is with you, in you, and wherever you go, you take him with you. Look at Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Who's this talking about? This is about Jesus. And he will reign as king, act wisely, do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Gosh, it keeps getting better, doesn't it? This is a work that he's doing in Israel, but he also is doing the same work in many ways in the believer as we submit to him. There's the issue of, again, ratification or confirmation of prophecy. Notice that next part, it goes to and to seal up the vision in prophecy, you know, oftentimes when you, you think of seal up, a lot of people say, well, that means to hide it. Well, the seal up, it, it not only uh, to seal up, but to finish, to stop, to complete. All the prophecy will be fulfilled and completed. There's no need for any more prophecy at this point because he will finish the work. So the expression seal up indicates there's no more needs to be added about it. It's been predicted and it'll be completed. And you and I have that assurance and, and that alone should just instill a joy in your heart and my heart. It means to end something or bring even close a fulfillment of prophecy. To seal up the vision of prophecy is to put an end to the necessity of any further revelations. And, you know, I get these emails all the time, further revelations and revelations and more revelations and more date setting all the time. And I've got them where most of them just go right into the spam box. I know what he's going to do. And I know what I need to do today, tomorrow, and the next day, and where my eyes need to be focused is upon him. He will complete, again, the, the scripture, the canon scripture. He'll fulfill all the prophecies, and they're all fulfilled in Christ Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, the glory, then will follow. For 70 weeks, they will be completed the fulfillment of the prophecy regarding, now this is important to understand, the Jews. It, this is really about the Jews. Now we can see there are certain things about God that is true that applies to all believers. 
But this prophecy, as I started, it is about Israel. It's about the Jewish people. It's about the city of Jerusalem. And I love it because God is going to be faithful to Israel, and he's going to be faithful to you and me. If he's not faithful to Israel, why are we even trusting in him? And, and, and people will find excuses and mock, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But again, God has, through his prophets, predicted certain events. These 70 weeks of years, they haven't all been fulfilled. But he will ratify these prophecies. They'll be confirmed in its fulfillment. Now listen to Isaiah 55, verse 11. So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to be empty without accomplishing what I desire, without succeeding in the matter for which I've sent. You know what's, you should hang on to this verse. You're here tonight, you're listening, or you're listening online. Do you realize what this is saying? So, will my word go forth from my mouth? This is God speaking to you and me. It will not return empty. God's saying, I'm going to accomplish something through this word in your heart, your mind. It will either bring you close to God, you'll either increase in your faith, or you will turn away from God and you will mock him. You have a choice. But I will accomplish. You will be left without excuse. Hell is filled with a lot of people that have mocked the word of God. Now they realize it's true, but guess what? It's too late. It's just too late once a person closes their eyes in this world. There's the issue of the reign of Christ, as we talked about, to anoint the most holy place. And there's going to be two different thoughts I'm going to give you here. I'll give you the view that I believe, that I believe lines up in the scripture, and why I don't agree with the other common view. Bible scholars believe that it's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy One, the anointed one of God, as the scripture would say. He's died, he's risen, he's given the kingdom, he's anointed as this king, he rules for a thousand years, and actually all eternity. Many people believe that, but not everyone believes that. He's a prophet. He's a priest, and he's a king. The climax of God's program for the Jew is that all the world will be reigning. Okay? Again, world history will be the reigning of, of Christ Jesus over the world. Every knee will bow to him. But there's a contrast to this, and I don't see and I don't understand. It's in Ezekiel 41 and 46. There are others who believe that this reference could be to the millennial temple. That it's going to be anointed and restored. That it's not about the temple itself. It's really about Jesus Christ. And you and I are being built up as a holy temple spiritually is what the scripture says shows us again and again the word most holy can be rendered a, a most holy place and that's why they use it. But all these above issues are fulfilled within the 70 week prophecy. That's 70 times 7 in the 490 years. We'll talk about that more. The millennial kingdoms after that 490 years. And it doesn't seem to line up with what the scripture is saying. It's afterwards. So when the end of the tribulation comes, Jesus Christ will be anointed. The church will come back with him. Look with me in verse 25. So you are to know and discern that the issue of the decree and restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince. There'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks it will be built again in a plaza and a moat even in times of distress. This 490 
year period of time is divided in three distinct parts. The seven weeks that we just saw, seven times seven is 49, and that's in verse 25. And then there's 62 weeks times seven, which is 434 years. And then there's a final week, which is the week of the tribulation, a week, one week of years, seven years. This is the last part that is still to be fulfilled. See, these first two, they've already been fulfilled. The time clock began when the 70 weeks, or the 490 years, when there, there was a command, as we just read, again, to restore and build Jerusalem. There's two important words there, restore and build. The Hebrew word for restore is to allow, to return, to go back, to restore, to refresh, even Repair. The Hebrew word for build means to build and rebuild and establish. And we know the temple was rebuilt. Predicting that the temple would be rebuilt even when they were in Babylon. They would know. The problem with knowing the exact date and the decree is no one really agrees the exact time. There's a confusion of the, the calendar when this was. Sir Robert Anderson, though, came up with the date March 445 B.C. and ended on April 6, 32 A.D. This is when he tried to describe it. But there is not an agreement on these dates of any of the historians, and they come up with all different types of things, and Nehemiah, and I don't want to go there, but, but Jerusalem was was rebuilt within 49 years of that starting point. Nehemiah's wall was constructed, project only took 52 days, but, but there was time, they were rebuilding their houses, and the rubble had to be moved, and, and all of that took 49 years. Sometimes we only focus on that 52, and we miss all the other things that had to be done. The walls, the streets, the moats were rebuilt. The midst of difficulty and opposition, if you read the story of Nehemiah and Ezra. Look with me in verse 26 of our text. And then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people, the prince who is to come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even the end, there will be war and desolations are determined. Three areas that we'll be able to address in this verse. It's really a map, as I mentioned, of God's future for God's people. Isn't that kind of neat? He gives a map, and he's given you a map. You know when you close your eyes in this place where you're going as a believer. You know when you close your eyes, you're going to open your eyes and behold the beauty of the king. The absent the body is to be present with the Lord, and in his presence is fullness of joy forever. I like that. I love that when someone has lost a loved one to, to read it, to write it in the card, because it, it, people know, and sometimes they're not able to deal with it, but they, they pull that card out from time to time, and they look at it, and they're, they're so thankful for the promises of God. How about you? Do you hold to those promises? There's the refusal of Christ. It says, then after 62 weeks, the Messiah be cut off and have nothing. That's the 434 years I mentioned. He came to his own, but they received him not. That, that phrase that was cut off. It speaks of being crucified or simply died. He came to his own, but again, they, they received him not. He came to receive the kingdom. His desire was to set up this millennial kingdom and rule. He would have set up if they'd only received him, if they'd only acknowledged him as the Messiah. Some people say, well, I only believe when the tribulation comes, then I'll believe, and it's too late in most cases. His triumph... Entry of Christ is a fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, where 
Christ officially presented himself to the nation of Israel as the Messiah. Now remember, every miracle he did were signs. Already spoken of Isaiah, they were signs of the Messiah. He had done them. There was no question that he had had performed these signs. The religious leaders knew he did these signs. In fact, in Zechariah 9, 9, as I mentioned, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming. He is just, endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foe of a donkey. He's presenting himself, humbly coming before them, and they received him not. Three days later, he would go to the cross. Jesus had to be familiar with the prophecy of Daniel. It's hard to be rejected by others, isn't it? That's a reason why a lot of people don't want to share their faith is because they're afraid of being rejected or telling even somebody that they're Christian because they don't want to be rejected. Luke 19, 42 says this, if you had known the day, even you, the things make for peace, but now it's been hidden from your eyes. There's a point of no return. When people, it's so clear in their heart that he is God and they have, re, they have chose to reject him God, again, like this passage. From the Jewish eyes, he's hidden from them. He's always brought a remnant out every generation, but there's a point that God hardens a person's heart. They can come to a point where they will no longer respond And this is what God did with Israel because they chose not to believe. So Daniel's prophecy was hidden from them. It's hidden from many in the church today because they deny this. Some say all this was fulfilled. And again, when Matthew 22, or excuse me, 24 was given many years ago, and that kind of confounds me when I read it. People believe what they want to believe. But will they believe what the scripture says? He was thus crucified, it appeared, as if he had nothing. He was cut off. Fulfilling prophecy. Now it's interesting because we're now in a period that's kind of like a pause in time. God stopped time and before. There's one week left to fulfill. That's what we call the Great Tribulation. We're in what's called that 69th week. The 70th week is still to be fulfilled. But this will only be fulfilled after the rapture of the church. Now, a lot of people beam me up, get me out of here. I understand that. Some have taken it so far as escapism. God's called us to occupy. God's called us to be a light and be a witness. And we really need to reevaluate our motives. And there's nothing wrong to say, come now, Lord Jesus, because I would like that too. But we should want to be faithful until the very end. And he's the one that will make you and me faithful until that very end. The seven-year tribulation is that final Again, 70th week, when God will deal with Israel, bring them to the realization that Jesus Christ was really God's son, the second person of the Godhead, the Messiah who came to his own. The clock for that final seven years begins ticking again when this Antichrist And the Jews sign a covenant together, a peace agreement, and and the whole world's looking for peace. Almost at any cost, isn't it? Many are so tired of war, they're willing to sacrifice everything. Matthew 16, verse 18 says this. It's a verse that I think we should all hang on to. And and Jesus speaking, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. No matter what is going on in this world, what will go on, 
God will not abandon you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He will keep you until that day. It's time for you to go home. He'll call you. Whether it's the rapture or not, we just know that rapture has to happen before that 70th week. There's still people that need to be saved prior to that situation. This interval period of time is what we call the, the church age, the age of grace. They're still blinded at this point, but there's a time that God is going to take the church out of the way. Christ had predicted the setting aside of that nation of Israel. Let me read again from Matthew 21, verse 42 through 43. And Jesus said to them, did you ever read the scripture, the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. God's expecting the church to produce fruit in this time. And no more bickering, dividing. I've used that term nomads where a person comes to church, says no, gets mad, moves on to the next church. And we need to get serious. We need to roll up our sleeves Get in, and it's serious time. He's coming soon. And there are hurting people in this world, and isn't that important? And you got the words of truth. What is wrong with us? Like Daniel, we should pray, God, forgive us, because the church is guilty today of self-centeredness, entertainment, and everything but what God has called us to do. There's the ruin and raising of the temple in Jerusalem. It's in verse 26. And the people, the prince who is to come, will destroy the city and sanctuary. You know, again, the prophecy in this passage continues a description of the judgment that is coming. And that it would come in a, in a, in a generation, uh, on the generation that rejects the Messiah. Okay, Jerusalem would be destroyed by the people of the ruler who will come. Not, not by the ruler himself, but by the, the people. See, again, not the ruler himself that will destroy him, but it is the people. Jesus warned the destruction, the temple. Luke 21, 24 says this, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into the nations and Jerusalem be trampled on underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is filled. That's when you and I are going to be caught up out of here. Matthew 24, 2 says that he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. You know, the leader, uh, again, of Rome, again, that was leading the battle, wanted to give freedom to Israel. Look, look, we won't destroy this city if you just stop what you're doing. Stop the rebellion. It was very important to Rome because if, if they were successful in the rebellion, all the rest of the, again, that known world that was under Rome would turn against them. But they wouldn't. And the men that were fighting, again, the Romans, when they would go and they go in the city, they would turn over every stone. They set the, the city on fire ablaze just to get all the gold that fell between the cracks. Fulfillment, exactly. Isn't that wonderful how God's prophecy fulfills right to the T? Nothing is overlooked. It was in A.D. 66... The culmination, again, it was in 70 A.D. When the, when the Jews were rebelling against Rome, and Rome says, finally, it's enough. Go and destroy and kill and level the temple. And that's what they did. Fulfilling the prophecy. Look at verse 26 again, and its end will come with a flood even to the end. There will be war and desolations determined. See, the destruction of Jerusalem did not end Israel's suffering. It did not end Israel's suffering. Gabriel said that the war is decreed and it would continue until the end. 
until the, the prophecy would be fulfilled. Even though Israel was to be set aside, she would continue to suffer until all the prophecies were fulfilled. Six million Jews died during World War II under Adolf Hitler. Their suffering is not over. During the tribulation, two-thirds of the Jewish population will be killed. Zechariah 13, verses 8 and 9 says this, it will come about at the land, and all the land declares the Lord that two parts will be cut off and perish. A third will be left in it. And I will bring a third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested, and they will call upon my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. You know, when everyone talks about all of Israel, say, hey, wait a second, two-thirds died during that tribulation. One third he brings through, one third that he talks about that is actually saved and declares that he is their Lord. Not all Israel is Israel. The events of the 70th week are focused on really one sole purpose a person, the Antichrist. God's going to take him down. Every prophecy will be fulfilled. The Antichrist will exalt himself in the temple, declare himself God, but God will deal with him. Listen as I read in closing 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come until or unless apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God and object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Detestable to God. God had created hell for Satan and his followers. How about you? Many people will deceive themselves, assured and confident in themselves. But is your confidence in Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross for you? Or is it a confidence in what you are doing right now? Father, we thank you for tonight, your word that is precious and timeless and gives us a map at the end times and such important as we see that, understand that it helps us bring illumination to the book of Revelation and other passages. Lord, we see that it is really about you, what you're going to do with the nation of Israel, the ones that you've chosen and set apart to be a light of the world and they weren't faithful. You set them aside and Lord, we know that if we're not faithful, you can set us aside too. Lord, we ask that you would just do a deep work in our hearts. Purge us of our sinfulness, our self-centeredness, our arrogance and self-righteousness, that, Lord, we come to you with a, a broken and contrite heart. Lord, there are many today that just really don't want to hear anything bad, oh, anything difficult, anything that doesn't sound comfortable. Well, Lord, they're going to deceive themselves in the end because they don't know why you're judging. They don't know what you have done that they might have life eternal. So, Lord, I pray if there's anyone listening tonight, tomorrow, the next day, that does not know you, Lord, that they will get down on their knees and cry out and know that you will save them. In Jesus' name, amen.